All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. This is, this is the last session. There's a little bit of innovation in the last session. Um, we're supposed to end by one, so we're going to try and do that. Maybe use another five or ten minutes. Elizabeth has uh, very generously provided us with a very last minute of music at the end of this session, just before we go out for lunch and say goodbye to each other. So thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Now, I would. this is going to be the final discussion panel, but <clears throat> as you know, Christopher has insisted that I show up some of my Everest slides, which uh, I need to ask for, for um, your understanding because I haven't processed them. They just came out from the computer. So uh, if you have, you, you can have a good side there or you want to sit here, but it's a very quickly... The reason I accepted to show these slides is because there's something on this expedition that might be useful for the um, common good. All right, so very quickly, this is at Everest Base Camp, uh, 17,000 feet, 5,400 meters. Uh, we were just there at the beginning of April, 5 of April, and I'm going to go very quickly. That's our base camp. This year, it's a lot of expeditions, 29 expeditions. We were a little bit sort of higher up. You can see the ex tents back there. Um, and so it's a very long, long climb up Mount Everest. Uh, you need to uh, establish four camps at different altitudes, 5,400 meters, 6,000 meters, 7, and 8,000 meters. And you need a lot of time to move things up. We were a big group of 10 uh, Chilean climbers plus 10 Sherpas climbing together. I must say that I was very, very happy to have one woman on the expedition, uh, 25 24 men and one woman, and uh, that woman was uh, very happily my daughter Sophia of 23. So there she is. Um, so there we are both both climbing together. So it's a it's a very long and a pretty treacherous climb, especially the part of the crevasse at the beginning. But uh, after uh, 40 days of working together, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute, you establish your very last camp at 8,000 meters in the South Col. Uh, you start from there very early in the morning. There's no pictures because it's at night. We start about midnight. And this is already at about 4 o'clock in the morning. We're using oxygen and we're uh, climbing for about 13 hours to get to the summit, more or less. Um, that's, that's the view you get from up there. The, the peak you see at the end is the fifth highest mountain. It's called Makalu and it's already below us. It's something incredible. And what you're seeing at the right side of the picture, so it's uh, at the left side of the picture is already China and Tibet. Everything was going very, very well on that day, but suddenly uh, bad weather started moving in. We had wind and snow, and uh, my daughter, who was at base camp, and he, she was working on the satellite, said, Papa, I think you should come down uh, because, you know, weather is deteriorating very quickly, and I see the front coming in in the, pic in the satellite picture. But we were very near, what you see up there is the south summit, which is about an hour and a half from the true summit. And I said, I'm going to make the last effort to get to the south summit so I'm able to see if there is truly bad weather uh, to the big summit. So we, we kept on climbing, and happily when we get to the south summit, we could see the main summit ahead. There was wind, but I say, we're going we're gonna to push for this. And um, so. That's the whole lot pushing for the main summit. This is a, a very, very uh, moving moment because this is the very famous Hillary step. The very first expedition, 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary and the Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. Every other expedition had been defeated at this step. You know, they, they reached this point and they had to turn down. This is at 8,800 meters, so it's very, very high, and it's a tricky piece of climb, of rock climbing up there. And so the first one to uh, overcome this, this crooks of the expedition was Sir Edmund Hillary back in 1953. And that's me uh, guiding the climb of, of Sir Edmund Hillary. Um, uh, they were, that's a good thing of being second. They know how to do it, you know, so, so, they, so they, not, not big deal. So that's coming out of the Hillary step. And once you're out of the Hillary step, you're still about 40 minutes from the summit, but you know you're going to make it. You know, it's, it's not, not, nobody's, nothing is going to stop you. So uh, 
This is, as you see in Makalu, we're very near the summit. And this is the actual summit. I reached the summit first. This was 18 of May, just last 18 of May, nearly a month ago. Uh, and now the, very, the, the, the classical summit is filled with these prayer flags from the Sherpas. You know, Sherpas do climb a lot. We, had, we invited eight of our Sherpas to climb with us, so uh, there's a big group. And the Sherpas on the last years have been putting these prayer flags on the summit. So the actual summit, the literal summit, you can't, you can't step on it because you will be stepping on prayer flags. So you stand short maybe two meters of that. So I took this picture with my family. It's a very important picture because when I climbed Everest 20 years ago, my youngest daughter, Elisa, wasn't born. And she's been demanding for 20 years that she wants her picture at the summit of Mount Everest, so there's a picture. Uh, <laughs> And there you see her, so, so that's the full family on the summit. But then I was able to do something absolutely incredible because I've reached the summit first. I took a few pictures and then turn around and start looking backwards to see my friends coming into the summit. And, and that was a very, very moving experience. Uh, somebody was saying, and it's written there, not you, uh, being the best but working for the best of the world. And, and this is something that, that really moved me. Uh, it was more important for me to see them climbing to the top than actually myself getting to the top. So it was a tremendous experience, and this is a quite incredible picture of 18 of us on the summit of Mount Everest. It's a br really good uh, effort group, and so all of them, you know, the Sherpas and, and uh, our members. Just one last picture, that's the true picture, and this is very important. This is a metaphor here. We talk about summits, this is the Sermat summit. Well, in true mountaineering, Summits are very, very important, but not the ultimate result. Uh, you achieve a climb when you do come back down safely to base camp, to the valley. Uh, this is what we call the very successful picture, is at the end of the expedition, when you're back down and everybody is sound and safe, and, and also friends and everything. So just last, one last reflection about a mountain perspective. Um, a lot of mountaineering is used as a metaphor for success. You know, reaching the summit, being the first up there, and that kind of thing. And I, I think we've been very successful in, in our mountain climbing career because we see mountaineers as a totally different thing. We don't, we don't talk about individuals. We don't talk about the collective good. We talk about relations. Relation is the main issue here in our mountain because relations if you see relations as your point of view, not the individual, not the collective, but relations as your point of view, then all these things develop. Empathy, collaboration, service to one another, generosity, synergy, and gratuitousness. And, I, and, and, and this is the very important thing I took from this expedition. Uh, these guys were excellent climbers, truly excellent climbers, very good climbers, technically and physically. But above all, they were good human beings, good persons, and I think that's the lesson to take from this climb. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, very quickly, very quickly, before I go into the panel, um, I'm going to just, I'm, gonna, I'm seeing this um, screen here, you're seeing it back there. Uh, what we learned today about uh, so, so covering the red thread that I did the last two days for, the, for this morning. And we had a very inspiring lecture by Carlo on, on Google um, about the, the role they're making. And I know we have a lot of doubts uh, relating the new technologies, the internet. But I think what I mainly got from Carlo, and apart from the points there and the Google values and everything, is Carlo's humaneness. You know, the, when, when you are in, uh, working for that, such a big and influential company in our lives, when you do recognize very openly that you're trying to do your best, that mistakes are made, but this is what you're trying to do, I think that's very, very uh, commendable. So I thank Carlo again for, for that splendid uh, lecture this morning, and I truly believe that you're doing a great job. So that's part of, of the summary. These things are gonna be all in the website, so. so. And then we had uh, two excellent panels. Um, before I go them, this uh, PowerPoint was handed in to the excellent people at the back before the last prices. And I was telling Carolina as we were sat down that no matter having Carlo or Manfred of this or Patrick, these great lectures that we've had through these days, 
seeing these young people receiving these awards for something incredible achievement is probably one of the most moving moments on all this Semat Summit. So thank you again for what you do. It's really impressive to have you people knowing what you do. Um, then we had, as I say, two, uh, this, this incredible panel about uh, 50 plus 20 and all what is being done. And I uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for, for all their work. And of course, uh, Eileen and Wolfgang and some of the things that are being said there. You have the materials. Uh, Mark gave me the, the small booklet on, on 50 plus 20. I do recommend it's out there in the lobby, so you take it. But then again, those are ma mainly the pains. I, I want to make a stress a point about uh, Eileen, who said innovation is simulated maybe more from failures than success. And I think that's a, and a great point. That we tend, because of we are into this successful set mind, when we fail, we tend to forget very quickly. And lessons can be drawn from that failures very, very much. So I thank you very much for that point of view. And Wolfgang, I want to uh, thank you. I know where you are, if you're in there. Um, about this experiential learning. You know, when, when you had the courage to leave what you were doing and went traveling the world with your wife and you tell us, it was a tremendous experiential learning process, a journey, as Mark said. So, so I thank you for that courage and, and that's part of what was said on that uh, one. So what we've been going, and this is now to the panel, that it's been going for the last three days. The first day we talk about common good, try to define it. We talk about, and I think we, we've now reached a sort of certain balance about the problems with the markets, but not truly demonizing them. We, some of the examples of you are doing is working with the markets. Uh, the need to uh, make change in governments. A critical point, at least for me, throughout these three days is the test for action. We n cannot just talk about common good. We need to take this down to the action level. So we've been seeing if we can, all of these definitions mean something for action, and that's what I call the test for actions. Then we have the workshops, and I want to commend Christopher and all the people in charge of CERMAT Summit. I think that's a great uh, part of this summit. Uh, of getting us being able to work among ourselves and not just sitting here and, and, he, and hearing this, you know, beautiful minds, I guarantee, I, and I grant that, but sometimes we need to talk and get to know each other. And I think that was a very good thing to do, uh, of, you know, of organizing this. And explicitly, what I've been getting from people, the X and Y uh, play show. It, that, that was so truly because it meant something with, with you. So well, that's what the first day, second day, uh, Manfred started with a incredible uh, review of economic thought. We talk about leadership, we talk about social business, we talk, Patrick did talk about emotion and passion, and you came up with this incredible humane in inventiveness and creativity in terms of energy, but we also seen it in this case. So, so that faith in, in human and human inventiveness and creativity. And today, uh, <coughs> the internet for common good, uh, just talk about Carlo, the technology for common good in general, not just, not just the uh, internet, we discuss a lot about business education and how that can be changed. Barriers to innovation, and I, uh, you were making the point that in, in academia, probably is one of the most conservative sectors anywhere else. You know, they, they're very slow in changing, so that's important. And again, the, the action test. What can we do to pass from, and somebody came up from this from, from the document, from the 50 plus 20 document into action in our business school. So there is, there is a wide scope that we've covered. And so I'm going to give it now to this wonderful gentleman to uh, conclude what has been their perspective of this for uh, three, uh, two and a half days. By the way, my, my slides are going to be available at the website, and, and Jackie down there has already uh, loaded them up. So uh, who would like to start, or I shall force you into it? <laughs> Jacob, please. An overview. I think what's what struck me more and more are these um, two cultures. You know, the novel by C. P. Snow. Then it was sort of science and humanities, and today really it's um, economics and the rest of us. Most of us don't understand, especially issues like money creation. And it reminds me of the Middle Ages, where if you wanted to discuss issues of power, and of course the power then was held by the church, those debates were only held in Latin. So if you didn't speak Latin, you couldn't participate. And I, one of our early Wright Laudit Award recipients is an engineer, and he once said to me, you know, I don't really understand this with economists. He said, if I design a plane which is supposed to go like this, and it goes like this, I'm out of a job. 
But these economists, all the time, they say things are going like this and they go like this, but they never seem to be out of a job. And to take a more you know, serious issue, Herman Daly, who was mentioned before, the steady state economics you know, pioneer, he once researched what a prominent Anglo-Saxon economist who advised our governments, whose advice they follow, say about climate change. And this is the Nobel laureate in economics, Schelling, it's Nordhaus, etc. And they all say more or less the same thing. They say climate change will really only badly affect the sector of agriculture, according to all the studies we see. But agriculture in an industrialized country like the USA is only about 3% of GDP. So even if half of that collapses, that's just a 1.5% loss of GDP. And of course, you know, we can grow, it can grow in other areas. So you, our governments are advised by people who generally believe that you can eat money. You know, if you just produce enough iPods and financial derivatives, it doesn't matter that food production is collapsing. So this is also, of course, the world. I mean, quite mad. It's not just what you disagree. It's, it's literally mad. But this is the world, of course, in which business schools operate and, and educate for. So we've proposed, and it's interesting, we made about 24 policy proposals, and the one the media picked up on was this idea that we need an eco-literacy test for business school graduates, for practicing economists, for candidates for public office. They need to understand eco-literacy, otherwise, you know, they don't qualify. But, you know, getting back to business schools, they had this oath you probably saw in the Financial Times a few years ago, introduced in, in 2008, well, you know, sort of an oath of, of moral, with moral values, and they said that the, the, the graduates who were taking this oath had fallen drastically from 2008 until last year. Only about a sixth, many were, were now taking it. And you think, now this is really shocking, but then you read that to, get a, to become a business school graduate in the USA, that education cost $180,000. So they start off, you know, $180,000 in debt. And, of course, you know, uh, no wonder that they are focused on paying off this debt. And if for some reason they then drop out, they are castigated in the, in the Economist, which from time to time complains that here we've wasted all this money on educating these business school graduates. And look, now they are resigning, they are leaving finance, going and having a duck farm in France or something like that. So it's regarded as not the thing to do. Until, of course, you know, you get old and you can reflect on life and the, the famous Swiss uh, speculator and investor, uh, Andre Costalani, when he was asked in his 80s, you know, to recommend the best tip he could give for this, this, to this journalist in this economics magazine, and he replied, invest in friends because the bank of heaven never goes bankrupt. But that, of course, was the conclusion he came to in his 80s. But, of course, once you step outside these big cities ruled by this, uh, this ideology, you find that you don't have to move to some Asian village or something, and the, the other economy, the economy of sharing, of reciprocity, still exists. I was went in a, into a, a village just about an hour from Rome in the middle of the winter, and I decided I'd like some firewood because the apartment I had borrowed from this Finnish guy had an open fireplace. Went out in the snowstorm looking for a place to buy firewood, met the guy who'd just come back you know, from the forest with his where he picked some firewood, obviously, you know, quite a lot of work. When he found out that I was staying in the apartment of his Finnish friend, he immediately gave me the firewood he picked up because he realized I wouldn't be able to do it. So this, this economy exists, and I think it's important to protect that and strengthen that against the ruling order, which, is, as Manfred Max Neef said, is really like a, a coup d'etat, this neoliberal e economic ideology which ruled the world. And I think it's also important being in Switzerland to emphasize that the biggest tax haven in the world. It's not Switzerland, it's never been Switzerland, the big tax haven where all many of these deals are done is the city of London. And uh, it, it was in England, of course, that you know, Thatcherism, this, this ideology, spread to Europe from the USA. And it was a very, very small minority. In fact, there were three think tanks created which took over the British Conservative Party, which brought neoliberalism to, neoliberalism to the UK. One of these think tanks was funded almost entirely by one chicken farmer quite a wealthy chicken farmer, of course. So one third of Thatcherism we have to thank one chicken farmer for. So, you know, why are we now in a situation which is very different from previous generations? You could become rich in the Middle Ages in Japan, but there were certain norms. If you lived as a rich person so as to cause envy among the people, this was the, the, the name for it, then the emperor could take away all your wealth. So there were certain norms which were respected. So why are we now getting into these increasing difficulties? Because we know, you know, as, as, as Chandran said, 
Swiss standards of living and resource consumption, to use the example here, are not globally replicable. This is just the truth. So what we are trying to do is not to create some sort of ideal world among many worlds. What we are trying to do, I think, with a meeting like this, is to prevent our world, and we can, will not be able to escape from it, it will hit the poorest first, but there is no escape, from descending into conflict, into resource conflicts, into increasing violence, the Pentagon fears as the British Ministry of Defense has you know, very scary predictions about what increasing climate change will do to peace in the world. And of course, I mean, it's important to emphasize when you say, you know, talk about markets, that markets and democracy will be among the first victims of, uh, you know, of, of such, a, such a collapse. So I think the first thing to realize and to accept is we are not as rich as we thought we were. You know, these growth uh, predictions have been based basically on the assumptions, again, that, you know, we can eat money. You know, my, my, most assets in the world are claims on claims on claims on claims. And um, in a business consultancy, Boston Consulting Group recently said that we're going to need a, to cut much of this debt because it's unpayable and reminded us the, the paper is called Back to Mesopotamia because in Mesopotamia, where well, as soon as a new ruler came, he basically created a sort of what the Christians call a jubilee year. And you know, they started afresh and, and you know, uh, debts, were, debts were forgiven. Because the real problem we face is that as soon as you say, let's follow the conventional route and you know, everybody agrees, from the political right to the political left, yes, of course, for markets really to work, costs need to be internalized. But the problem is, if for decades you have externalized costs to, to the extent of so many trillion, externalized at the cost of future generations, uh, externalized at the expense of our environment, once you try to change that, you end up with, with chaos, with revolutions. If you try to, to abolish petrol subsidies, in, in many countries, uh, you have a revolution on your hand, as the Nigerian president found when he tried that you know, a couple of months ago. So you know, how do we move to societies, to economies of the common good? And there is so much you can do as individuals, as businesses, of course. But unless you change the policy framework, unless you make sure that the incentives and you know, policies, laws, regulations, institutions, they create incentives for markets, for individuals, for societies, for innovators, and unless they help pointing in the right direction, you know, then we're not going to make it in time because we are going to have our little niche and we can, whatever our powers are, we can do more. And if we have, you know, if we have our own family business, we can do more than if, as you know, you, we're dependent on shareholders. But it's quite clear it's not going to be enough. So you need to look at policies. You need to look at uh, as was said, you know, uh, I think it was yesterday, shouldn't uh, all corporations be benefit corporations? Should we give the privilege of limited uh, corporate liability to corporations who are not serving the common good? Should there be rights and privileges without duties and obligations and responsibilities? Well, I think the argument to me is no. And secondly, we need to look at money and we need to understand and educate ourselves about money because if you don't understand how money is created in a world ruled by money, then basically you have disempowered yourself. So I think this is another issue we are looking at. It's not, of course, enough. We need to look at how we reduce potential for conflict in this world of growing conflict. So we need to look at the fact that we still have all these nuclear bombs uh, targeted. We need to uh, look at um, the whole question of institutions, what we do with um, pension funds with these investments. You mentioned yesterday, I think the Norwegian state pension fund has very clear criteria about what it invests in and what it doesn't invest in. We think that needs to be replicated. We need to spread renewable energies as fast as possible because every day you don't use the sun, you waste it because the sun today you can't use anymore tomorrow. You know, you can use tomorrow's sun, but not today's sun. Instead, we are burning valuable fossil fuels, which have a value for future generations to them. They may also want the petrochemical industry, but if we burned all the fuels, we have wasted it instead of using, you know, the sun, the sun and the wind. We need to make sure that financial gambling, you know, uh, not hedging of, on, on the real prices of the harvest, etc., but pure gambling on future prices, again, becomes qualified as gambling, which it used to be in many countries until about 10 years ago, which meant that such contracts are not legally enforceable, which means that, you know, people can play around with them, but they can't affect the, uh, the, 
the real economy. We need a green tax shift. We need to tax what we need to use less of, i.e. resources, and shift away from taxing labor, from taxing work, which clearly we need more of. We need to you know, have corporate law reform, as I mentioned. We need to make sure that we account for uh, ecosystem losses or biodiversity losses. And this whole question of discounting the future so that the future is worth less depends on the assumption that in the future we'll all be richer. And as Pavan Suktev, you know, who's not seconded by Deutsche Bank to, to UNEP to look into this, he said, but if in the future we fear we're going to be poorer, we should have negative discount rates. Now, you can imagine what revolutionary effects that would have on the market. And, you know, there are a number of other issues. As I mentioned, the ecological literacy. We should also make sure, of course, that all um, women in the world have the, the right, absolute right to... to uh, contraceptive facilities so that all children born into this world are wanted children. Those are some of the key policies which I hope we can, we can focus on. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> that, that's, that's a huge agenda of things that we need to do. Um, recover your stone, Mark. Uh, so, so, Father. <laughs> Maybe I will speak in, in French because... Uh, <laughs> yeah. It will be easier for me to, to express me in French. Uh, and I'd like to come back to the uh, central idea um, upon which the uh, Zermatt Summit is based uh, and addressing the actors of change. Because I think what the 20th century has taught us is that ideologies and models uh, are not sufficient to change the world. We need them but we need to go beyond. And we cannot simply think in terms of ideology or model, and this is where it led us. What we are trying to do today is, is to come back to the human being. So it may be a little bit paradoxical uh, between when we talk about this world independence, um, increasing complexification of relations and the impossibility, because complexification leads to two uh, situations, the resilience of uh, complex systems, which are uh, in a position to bounce back and uh, start anew. So you don't really see a crisis coming, because resilience enables uh, you to um, look elsewhere. But the um, crisis is about to come. And the second situation is that you, we don't really know where, in which, from which angle to tackle the problem to find a solution. So this brings us back to personal liability to a personal change which is required. And um, Manfred mentioned evolution and development and the emergence of stupidity. I would like to see evolution differently. Uh, even, and, and even Darwin said so. He said that what is striking is that at the end of this uh, evolution over a m billion years, uh, you eventually arrive at the uh, appearance of a being which uh, uh, negates natural selection. So, in fact, we have a very vulnerable uh, end product or human or, or being. So, it is vulnerability which is uh, a part of our process. And Jacob uh, the paleontologist who discovered Lucy, he was struck amongst all his research work. He, he said, Well, what struck me is to have found uh, tombs of some 13,000 years ago, uh, 13,000 or 9,000 years ago. So this is a nomadic period where uh, the population was still nomadic. And uh, we found uh, people who had been handicapped, handicapped people, either um, from uh, people who had a uh, um, blocked uh, jaw. And these people had been cared for. They had been fed. They had been cared for. They had been carried and had been buried with the same dignity as anybody else. And so the emergence of humanity is really when we start considering vulnerability. And I think that this is the first key. There will only be common, a common good when the most vulnerable of, amongst us is being considered. And Gandhi said the quality of a democracy can be judged in its way of caring for its poorest member. That is my first observation. My second observation, uh, and I'll come back to vulnerability, it's um, first of all, you have to wonder, you have to marvel. You have to marvel when you meet um, the positive aspects. And then you can you can uh, react to the negative aspects also because negative is really the lack of positive, right? So there, if if uh, we are shocked by a given situation and if we feel 
upset by, and which is logical, which is uh, which is natural. It is because we were made to um, uh, respect the positive and the good sides, and otherwise it leads to violence and to aggression and uh, not the uh, very essence of the, our vulnerability, which is love. I, th I think that there is an emergence of love, an emergence of compassion, an emergence of uh, the care we give someone else. And the second observation of Darwin was to say that this very vulnerable being manages to solve problems, to survive in a very hostile environment. And uh, the, the, the passionate element here is the link to culture. And, uh, a love for culture which goes beyond culture and to reach spirituality. So I think that these are a few keys that uh, help us define common uh, good. We need to consider the vulnerable being and uh, an economic system can also be judged on the way it cares for the vulnerable beings in this economy. When I went to Chile, I was very surprised. This is right after the earthquake and uh, Chile was very proud for in 20 years they had managed to overcome 40% of uh, poverty. And of course, after the earthquake, it was devastating. And you'd see a tremendous solidarity. Um, a small child in, in a slum had given his, uh, his uh, toy for the victims of the earthquake. And at a point in time, says, well, I also have shoes which I can give. My shoes. I said, but those are your shoes. Yes. but. I've, I've seen I've seen the, these uh, children. I can I can go barefoot, but they need shoes. So we've also seen entrepreneurs and uh, um, other people who have contributed to an extraordinary um, gestures. And uh, but we've also seen very ag egotistic behavior. So it's it's really questioning of society, and you can and then you can and between sociology between. Um, there was no separation between um, groups of society, but between categories of people who were egoistic and people who were generous. And this is really the, uh, the link. And this brings me back to another um, reflection. And um, um, this is uh, Peter Sloterdijk, a German philosopher, an atheist, who has just published a book uh, called You Need to Change Your Life. And he says that the new imperative Today's new imperative is not the imperative that Kant uh, published, and uh, um, perhaps I'll have come to come back and explain this. He calls it the metanoic imperative because metanoia in Greek means conversion. And he says previously it was God who, who proclaimed this. Well, today it is the crisis which uh, makes us change. If we don't change, if there is no metanoia, if there is no conversion, we cannot go forward. And he also claims that it is each and everybody who has to act and has to change. We are the players, the actors behind this change. And perhaps it is the tremendous emergence of uh, globalization and complexification of uh, globalization, which brings us back to seriously consider, reconsider personal liability and based on this metanoia, metanoia in, Greece, in Greek means a change of intelligence, a change of approach, a change of understanding, and uh, so changing minds. And uh, perhaps we, we say changing hearts and minds. I don't know if hearts come first and minds second or the other way around, uh, but they are linked. If, if a heart is changed uh, due to compassion, then the mind frame can also be changed. And as somebody who changes his mind first into on an intellectual level, and comes to the same conclusion, perhaps will change uh, his uh, behavior and his heart. And uh, can say, well, this is wrong, or this is wrong, or this is wrong. Now, when you show uh, somebody, you point your finger at somebody, three fingers f point back at you. So it's a boomerang effect, but a triple boomerang effect. So you can see that the change really uh, has to come from yourself first. This is one of the basic requirements. How is change going to operate? Well. It will come through love, and I think that the sense of justice will come with the sense of love. And when I say justice, it is um, not the concept of the 18th century justice, which led to a very egotistic uh, society. But justice is what I can give back, back to someone else, what I can share with someone else. Uh, so it's an act of justice which um, pushes me to go beyond 
uh, myself. And uh, Livia said uh, the, it is the face of somebody else who already establishes the, the uh, relationship. When he sees a face, he says, well, then I will become responsible for this face and my life will have to be changed by, um, through the contemplation of this face. And we need courage. We need courage to act. Perhaps this is the most tragic element in our society. There, there is a lack of courage. We need to have uh, heroes that show us courage. Sometimes we call them saints. Um, François d'Assisi, uh, when the financial industrial society starts, um, the, the beginning of international trade, um, he goes back to poverty, which really brings back to the very sense of wealth, because poverty is, is linked to wealth. It is the, the opposite. And we can also take the example of Mother Teresa. One day she was asked by a journalist, for, for one million dollar, I would not be doing this. And Mother Teresa said, for a million dollar, I wouldn't do it either. But for the love of God, I can. So, and Gandhi, who is, who, who is really re revolutionary uh, in a sense, it's not Che Guevara, it's Gandhi, who is the political revolutionary. Because in his, through his own change, through his own way, his own behavior, his way of uh, relating to someone else, he says, if the other person doesn't hear me, that means I'm not transparent enough. And it's not his problem. It is my lack of transparency uh, which um, prevents the light in my heart to touch the other person. So I need to change. So Gandhi was not a psychological pressure um, addressed to the other person. It, it is his own change so that his own light could shine and be seen by the other person. And Aung San Suu Kyi, who was uh, this other a figure of light, uh, of resistance of uh, to the dictator. The first uh, uh, words she pronounces when she comes out of prison is pardon. And uh, we have the same in Mandela in South Africa. You have some of these figures who really through their own life um, are the are, are witness to um, an extraordinary attitude of change. So it's not simply a matter of theory, theory of change, or, or even theory of values. Uh, you need to, to um, translate these values into actions. And therefore, we also need to have witnesses, um, pioneers who will show us the, the way to go. And I would also like to say, uh, I am also a passionate mountaineer, as you know. Um, I'd like to come back to an old Tibetan saying, saying that once you reach the summit, well, go on, keep, keep climbing, keep climbing. There's higher up. And behind the summit, there is already the, um, you can already grasp heaven. And I think this is, <clears throat> this is part of the change, the crisis. There were two walls that brought down the humanity, the wall of Berlin, which came down in 89, and then Wall Street, which is soon going to come down. These two walls really uh, prevent us from linking and uh, talking to everybody. So, and I think that the construction of this um, financial power, which is no longer a service of the, the economy, which is, uh, has become at the service of individuals. And if we could reconsider this in thought, well, then I think that uh, I'm sure that uh, twice the population of this world could uh, find um, jobs and be happy. And I think that this uh, metanoia, this conversion, which I mentioned, the um, is uh, I cannot reach it uh, with my own uh, um, will alone, but uh, God's will will need to help me, and this uh, will enable us to go forward. Thank you. Merci. I thank you. I think uh, the two things I need to say. One is 
Father Nicolas. J'aimerais dire deux choses. Comme l'a dit le Père Nicolas au début, nous nous sommes retrouvés ce matin à, 19, à 7h30. Ça, c'est l'idée de Christopher. Après avoir fini au bar à 1h du matin, nous nous sommes retrouvés à 7h du matin. Et Nicolas disait, mais il me faut deux minutes pour intervenir. Bon, mais il a pris un peu plus de temps. C'est vrai. Mais euh, entre Jacob et le Père Nicolas, What we need to do to change markets, business schools, and everything. But also, as he was saying, pointing out these three fingers back to us, what we as individuals need to do. And he's giving us this incredible perspective of how courage is needed. I remember when you were mentioning this about Nelson Mandela saying, uh, you need courage to decide that you're going to be the light in the room. You know? So I thank you very much. For, but you gave this incredible perspective of of what it's possible to do. So in that light, I'm going to give the word to, sorry, the stone. Give me back the stone. Uh, to Patrick. When, when, when you have the stone, you can speak, everybody hears. In, in, Zulu, in Zulu villages, they give you a piece of wood called mboti. And when you have the mboti, you speak, the other people hear. <laughs> and stones are important things. Stones can be used to build houses and to destroy human life. A stone, I think stone is an amazing thing. Uh, for me, uh, looking at the sea or at the mountain, uh, we are close to God. And I think for me, one of the special things about being Zermatt here has been a sense of the presence of God for me. And uh, I know that many of us here have faith. Uh, many of us are Christian, not all. There are many faith traditions here, but it has been a spiritual journey to be here, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful, Christopher, for your leadership that you have brought, and your generosity of spirit, and the hospitality and the warmth with Antonin and others. I would like to give a, a round of applause to appreciate it. And of course, uh, when we see the mountains, human beings come and go, but the mountains endure. And we, it helps us to see perhaps a sense of our own place in human history, which is very small. And these debates will come and go, summits come and go. And I'm interested as a futurist in what history will record, what future generations will write about this period in 2300. Pray God we are still on the earth in 3,500, in 7,000 years' time. What will people record of this period of history? As we enter this third millennium, we are only in the first hours of the third millennium. And I come back to that word of sustainability, which in its widest sense is everything that we are talking about. It's uh, seeking a way to live uh, for the common good, to live in a way... Uh, that reflects the values of our Creator, that is uh, in harmony with creation itself, in harmony with each other, uh, looking for a, um, um, a safer and more mature and adult way to exist together on this earth, uh, with values that can sustain humankind for many thousands of years to come. It could be said that we are only in the first day of capitalism as a system, if you think of the uh, unfolding uh, centuries of human history, we are certainly only in the first half of a second of the digital age, the Google age. And we are uh, only in the first uh, day and a half of uh, consideration of what it actually means uh, to be a global society. And So for me, I think there's a sense of privilege that we are alive at this time, at this place of transition. I think that we have to be realistic. If we are looking to uh, promote the common good as a powerful theme, then we uh, will need to find a language which uh, humankind as a whole can understand. And actually, uh, I've been impressed by Um, two different kinds of conversations I've had. Uh, there have been some who have come up to me and had conversations, and you live in Switzerland, uh, you live in Zurich or Paris or Madrid or London, 
Or you might even live in uh, Argentina or Chile or wherever, and this is one kind of conversation. And then I've had another kind of conversation uh, with people who live um, maybe in India uh, in, uh, um, or have spent much time in China or living in Africa, and the conversations are playing out differently. When we think about common good, and you remember I've talked about the four circles of the human heart. We start with our own needs, and then we learn to understand the needs of our families and our friends, and then our communities, and then the wider world. But it is a fact that at a time of crisis, the perspective of the human spirit becomes narrow. And let me give an example. Uh, you may have a, a mother who is involved in all kinds of philanthropic exercises in Zermatt. And then she gives birth to a child. And the child is fighting for life because the child has only half a heart. I promise you, at that moment, she will suspend all her humanitarian work. It's not that her passion has gone, but that her focus is narrow. Quite rightly so. And if you are a Zimbabwean orphan, and you are 15 years old, and you live in a mud hut, and there's water coming through the ceiling because your mother and father have died, and you are looking, you have responsibilities yourself for a seven-year-old brother, a six-year-old sister, and a two-year-old brother who you are trying to feed. And the only way you can survive is to, as a girl, in that, and that, as an orphan, is to sell your body to your uncle for food. You have a narrow view about the common good. Uh, we have heard a great debate about whether our world can afford economic growth. I tell you this is not in doubt. We have to afford it. We have to find it. This country does not need economic growth. My country could do with economic decline, and we will still be fine on a modest scale. We could see in the UK our own GDP, GDP fall gradually by 0.5% over a number of years. It would be painful, but life would not end for us. But please, please, I beg you, my friends, do not impose such a, um, a language on, uh, on my friends in Zimbabwe. When Mugabe goes, I pray there will be economic growth in Zimbabwe. Don't you? Yeah? I pray for my, my brothers and sisters in the poorest parts of rural India that there is economic growth for them. It's easy for us to say, oh, no, no, it's impossible for people in India to all aspire to have a cars. It's, we, we must stop this nonsense right now. But I notice the people who say these things always have cars. They always have cars. I have never heard anybody who doesn't have a car come out with this rhetoric. Maybe I'm exaggerating to make a point, but it is usually people who are in the Western developed world who are so clear that economic growth cannot be afforded. And what I find interesting about this is that when we look at a 3,000 year perspective of human ingenuity and innovation, if we look even back 150 years of human innovation, and we see astonishing progress. We think of the technology which drove you, your body, and enabled your body to climb the mountain of Everest. Technology which uh, people 100 years ago could only have dreamed at. Uh, we think of a technology which has given us electric light. This was science fiction 125 years ago. We didn't understand electricity at all. And human knowledge is doubling at the rate of every 12 months at the moment, which means that we will know one billion times more than we know today in two or three decades. It is inconceivable to me that somehow human history, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, the development of societies and technologies and innovations, will stop. One of the reasons why our world will grow wealthier is not because we sort of create wealth, it's just we find cheaper and easier and more efficient ways to deliver things that people need. The reason why this is important is because if we wish our whole world to have this wider view of the common good, it will be an easier conversation if the whole world has food to eat. If they have fresh water, and if they have the dignity of knowing that they can care for their children when they're sick and get help. And I know that our world can do this. I know. People say, oh, how can we feed the world? I think, I don't know what planet you're on. 
And just look at the advances in food technology, food production technology in the last six to eight months or six years. Look at the green revolution we had in India and see how we could scale that in Africa today. Look at the next generations of crops and more efficient use of land. We have, we have easily the capacity to feed well um, 12 billion people, easily. And one easy way to do it is for us to eat less meat <laughs> because cows are very inefficient. Okay? So, and, and the same is true of many, many other resource issues. So what I'm saying is this, that um, I believe that this concept is really important. We are at a point of inflection in human history uh, and that uh, the, this principle of common good is, I believe, almost universally accepted in different philosophical traditions and religious systems. And that if we can fix some of the worst injustices in our world in terms of poverty, I believe it will be easier to have this conversation. Another thing that gives me hope, and with this I finish, is that in forming a tribe of tribes, in forming a, a concept of humankind as a whole, to change the language from them to us, we have um, the world of Google, <laughs> And we have the world of YouTube, the world of media, which helps us. It helps us to live at peace. It is quite difficult now for a nation to declare war on another. Because in a Google age, a YouTube age, every time a child loses an arm separated from its body by a, by a bullet or something like that, it's seen on TV. Uh, these things expose the realities of conflict to us. And they help us to encourage a, a more understanding future. I'm praying not for forums. I'm not terribly interested in forums alone. I am praying for a people movement, a, a, a movement which is viral, uh, which will transform the way that six billion people breathe the air together, I, a, a, a movement which is similar to those that we have seen in the past on other issues. And I'm seeing it happen. And it's a linking up of smaller people movements, of which this is one. This is a people movement amongst many around our world right now. And as these people movements link together, I believe that we will see the transformation that we need. And uh, I thank God for that. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <clears throat> I, thank you. Uh, we still have about 10 minutes. I'm going to give the word to Christopher. Uh, but think about your, well, I'll, I'll do an exercise on questions. So, so. Bear with me. One thing I want to say, I want to thank Patrick because there's this magnificent book written by Charles Dickens who starts, it was the worst of time, it was the best of times. And I think we've, we've been looking at the worst part of our world, which is certainly there are lots of it, but there's also very good, and, and I go back to these three, one lady and these two gentlemen of what they're doing. So it's, I thank you Patrick for bringing that perspective that is a lot of things good going on that we can tap into and change this for a better world. Christopher. Thank you, Rodrigo. We will finish with music, so Elizabeth will play for us in a few minutes. So I will not use my 10 minutes. Uh, I want to thank first uh, our prestigious speakers and for the quality of the event. And I think like uh, Patrick is saying, this is a people movement. And the challenge is how to connect this movement with other movements so that really a change will take place in the world and that we reach a critical mass. I want to just say one word, it's thank you. Thank you to uh, all the people behind the summit because whether you know it or not, there's more than 60 people working to reach this level of excellence in, in, in this meeting. And so I cannot name all, the, all of them individually, but it's ovation on the technical part. They're in the back of the <laughs> other part. Agence Publique, Roger Bertuzzi and the whole team, thank you because without you. It's really my team in my office, uh, we are two, actually two people behind the summit in my office. <laughs> Jackie, Kathy, Catherine. Um, 
Zewau, the people who have the wonderful artists who have been <laughs> illustrating. <laughs> and uh, also organizing these interactive workshops with Zewau. Very interesting, very creative. This was the first time we actually did this. And so my conclusion is there will be an official press release, which I will not now read you the contents of, and I will need maybe the help of Jacob, maybe Patrick, to, to just read it through. Um, we, um, we have most of the information on the website, on our website, available, including the drawings. No, the conclusion is let's continue climbing. Mm -hmm. That's right. Let's continue climbing <laughs> for the common good. Thank you very much. So now we just have a few minute minutes of... Um, after, after this closing session, we're going to go for lunch, and then we can have a lot of discussions and conversations, and thank you very much for that. I... I want to thank you. No, no. <laughs> I... I... Thank you. I... Thanks. I, I didn't say something about Everest, because um, I, I thought it wasn't... It was very important for me, but it was not part of what I was th thinking of. But I met Elizabeth three years ago when I came, very first came to Zerman, just as Malika. And Malika is around. Yeah, thank you very much, Malika, for your great performance. Yadavan. And she was, my, my wife is a musician as well, and so I approached Elizabeth and, and I said, would you give me one of your you know, d CDs because I heard her playing and it was really moving and especially in this landscape. And she gave me one, not one, actually three, and she signed them for Pachi, my wife. And, and we uh, got used to hear Elizabeth in our home. And, and you know, sometimes these digital equipments of this great technology uh, really move you into the place. And I took quote unquote, Elizabeth to Everest. And it was a moving moment when we, uh, rather than hearing it in, in, you know, in your own iPods, we took the, the speakers out yeah, and, we, and we played your music to the whole volume possible in the midst of these mountains. It was one of a very moving <laughs> moments. Yeah.